Amen. Amen. That's all right. That's all right. Amen. Every day will be like Sunday after a while. Amen. That's our hope, brothers and sisters. That is our hope that we're just passing through. We're just passing through this world, but we're going into, we're going to go to a place where every day is going to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Day. Beautiful selection. Beautiful selection. Praise the Lord. And praise the Lord for all of you who are here with us today. It's another beautiful day in the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I'm just glad to be in it. I'm just glad. You know, they say it's a good day when you are above ground and vertical. <laughs> so praise the Lord. I just thank God that I am above ground and I am vertical. Have full activity of my limbs, clothed in my right mind, though some might disagree with that, but clothed in my right mind, a reasonable portion, reasonable portion of health and strength. So I'm thankful to the Lord for another day, another day when I can lift up his name. Amen. Amen. And I'm thankful for all of you and your presence here today. Um, God is so good. He's so good. He's good in good times, and he's good all the time, even in bad times. Amen. And I'm thankful for my lovely bride who's over this way, right over there, uh, as always, by my side, propping me up, my armor bearer. So I'm thankful for her um, and her presence as well. And there is a word from the Lord. We, uh, we read earlier uh, from Luke chapter 4, verse, starting at verse 16. And I just want to touch on that again um, real quick. Um, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And the word reads, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Amen. Oh, and he began, verse 21, verse 21. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Amen. So we just thank God for his word and may he add a blessing upon the reading and the hearing of his word. So brothers and sisters, today I just want to spend a few minutes with you reasoning from this topic. Jesus, the G-O-A-T. Jesus, the G-O-A-T. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for um, just the presence of the saints. And we pray, Lord, that what we do here will be edifying to them, but more importantly, will be glorifying to you. And Father, our prayer, as always, is that you'll let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, let that be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Jesus, the G-O-A-T, the GOAT. And it's become, it's become a big thing now um, as I survey uh, our culture today on social media and on TV to talk about individuals who are in sports or entertainment as GOATs. And GOATs is an acronym that means the greatest of all time. G-O-A-T, greatest of all time. So this past week, there were several things that happened that hit me kind of hard. 
And, and it just made me focus on this idea of the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Now on Friday, on Friday, we learned that um, Hank Aaron passed away. And I was fortunate enough way back to be on a plane, riding on a plane with him. And I got his autograph. Hank Aaron is a Hall of Fame baseball player. And he's known for breaking Babe Ruth's home run record. Um, and it's a record that stood for over 30 years. And he continued to hold and continues to hold several other baseball records. And because of this, and because of his accomplishments on the baseball field, some say that he was the GOAT for baseball, the greatest of all time. Then last week, I'm watching this documentary on Tiger Woods. And there were those that would say Tiger Woods is the greatest of all time in golf. And then last week, I'm watching football on television and I'm watching uh, the playoff game with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady, who's the quarterback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they, their team won the playoff game. I can't stand Tam, Tom Brady. I, can't, I just don't like him. But he's a very good quarterback. And some say, and we're saying on this program that he is the GOAT, the greatest of all time in football. And you know what? Um, because of this, people, people say other people are the, are the greatest of all time. Um, Muhammad Ali the boxer, the former heavyweight champion of the world. He called himself the greatest. And there are other people who were called the greatest of all time. Goats, the greatest of all time. Some people say Serena Williams in tennis, Michael Jordan in basketball, um, Wayne Gretzky in hockey. And even in entertainment, they say the greatest of all time in entertainment was Michael Jackson. Now, there's a problem with this designation, right? There's a problem because everybody doesn't agree on the people that get this designation. And they can argue and they will present a case that somebody else should be the GOAT. You know, it'd be like Michael Jordan. No, no, no. He's not the GOAT. The GOAT is LeBron James. Tiger Woods? No, you got to be out of your mind. It's not Tiger Woods. Jack Nicklaus was the greatest golfer of all time. Hank Aaron for baseball? No, no. Willie Mays was the greatest baseball player. And Michael Jackson, the greatest entertainer of all time? No way. No way. Some people would say Elvis Presley was the greatest entertainer of all time. And so on and so on. People will argue back and forth. And especially used to, I remember when we could go to the barbershop, there would be these arguments in the barbershop about who the greatest of all time was, no matter what sport it was or entertainment, whatever. But let me tell you one thing, but there's one thing I do know, and there's no dispute about the greatest person in the history of the world. Hallelujah. Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is the greatest of all time. Jesus lived with purpose. Jesus lived to serve other people. Jesus lived with passion. Jesus is the greatest of all time. So when we say he's great, we're not just saying that he's great. We're saying that he's the greatest. Nobody can compare with him. There is no one beside him. No one can even come close to him. He eclipses every other great individual or personality that ever existed or that will ever exist. Jesus has it like that. He's amazing like that. He's God. And when we say that he's God, we say that he's God all by himself. Hallelujah. We mean that he's in a class of his own. Nobody compares to Jesus. So all through the Bible and before he's born, all through the Bible, we see prophecies go out about who Jesus is going to be, how great he's going to be. And so in Isaiah chapter 61, this is an amazing prophecy because in it, Isaiah presents the promise of the coming Messiah, the promise of what Jesus was going to do on earth. And then, as God would have it, from today's text that we read in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes into the synagogue one morning. 
because this was this was a tradition for young men to step up and then they would give them a scroll a scripture from the old testament and they would open it up and they would read it in the hearing of everybody that was there so jesus is in the synagogue on this day and he steps up to read and they give him the scroll of isaiah and he happens to turn to the very place that speaks to the prophecy about him, Isaiah 61, hallelujah. So Jesus opens up the scroll and he reads these words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and, the, and recovering of sight to the blind. Now, in Isaiah, if you look at Isaiah 61, Isaiah didn't say anything about recovering of sight to the blind. So when you read Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus, he doesn't say anything about recovering sight to the blind. And there was a reason, I believe, that Jesus was saying recovery of sight to the blind, why he added that in. And he goes on to say, to set at liberty to them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closes the book. He closes the book, he closes the scroll, and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down. And the eyes of them, of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now you gotta understand, you gotta understand this. This was a very dramatic scene. And if you can picture it, Jesus is back in his hometown of Nazareth, where he had been raised, and he goes to the synagogue for worship. And it wasn't an unusual thing for him to do this. The Bible says it was his custom to worship on the Sabbath. And Jesus was faithful in his worship of God and faithful to his church. And this was the same synagogue that Jesus had always attended when he was a child. And it was a small community in Nazareth where everybody knew everybody else. And Jesus and the congregation, they were neighbors. And some of them were close to his family. Now, the synagogue, just so you know, was different from the temple. Because in the synagogue, they didn't do sacrifices. The synagogue was a place for teaching and a place for reading. The synagogue was a place where men came to learn. Now, the temple in Jerusalem was the place where the priest offered sacrifices to God. And another difference between the synagogue and the temple was in, was in the fact that the temple, the priests were in charge, but they didn't have priests. They didn't have preachers. They didn't have ministers as we would know them today in the synagogue. Each man had an opportunity to participate in whenever there was the time for reading and learning. And a man would volunteer to read a passage from the scrolls of the Old Testament and then he would sit down and explain what those passages, the passages that he read, what they meant to him. So the leaders have been hearing all these stories about their neighbor, Jesus, and they invited him to read and to preach on this Sabbath. Now there's victory, there's victory in what Jesus says. The victory is that he says all these things that the coming Messiah is going to be. And at the end of what he reads, He's like, and by the way, that's me. Boom, mic drop, hallelujah, mic drop. And you know, there are people that make all kinds of promises and pronouncements. There are people in the world that do those kinds of things. And before they join a team, if you're talking about sports, or before they join an organization, they make a lot of noise. They make a lot of predictions. They might even talk a little trash. They might talk a little junk, talk big and bad about how amazing they are and about how great everything is going to be because they're there, because of their presence, because of them. So if I had rolled, just for example, if I had rolled up at Olive Branch in July of 2019 and announced to Olive Branch that I was the greatest pastor of all time, y'all would have given me the side eye. You'd be like, wait a minute, hold up. Ain't this that dude from Malibu's Crossroads been ordained a minute, been an ordained minister for about a minute, ain't never been a pastor before. Now he's up here claiming to be the greatest pastor that ever lived. I don't think so. Y'all would have thrown me out. Y'all wouldn't have none of that. 
And the people in the synagogue had a similar reaction. They were like, hold up, wait a minute. Ain't this Joseph's boy? Ain't he a carpenter? Didn't he build me a table? Didn't he build me some cabinets a few years ago? And the more Jesus spoke, the madder they got. They were so mad at the end of what he said, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. But Jesus, but Jesus, Jesus is different. Because when Jesus promises, he delivers on his promise. When Jesus makes a pronouncement, that pronouncement is going to be true. So in verse 21, he says, today, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And he was telling the truth, y'all. Jesus dropped a bombshell on this congregation. He dropped a bombshell in the synagogue. He's shaking them up. He's telling them that he's God's salvation in the world. Through him, God's deliverance. Through him, God's promise of hope. Through him, God's promise of freedom has come to his people. Jesus is revealing something about himself. He's making clear what his mission is going to be. He's making clear what his calling is going to be. His task is what, what that's going to be as he goes about his ministry on this earth. Jesus is setting the scope, he's setting the limits, and he's setting the horizons of his ministry. Hallelujah. And only Jesus could claim that. Only Jesus could say that. Only Jesus could do that. Only Jesus could walk into a room, a synagogue, where people have been reading scripture for hundreds of years and go, you know what I just read? You know that prophecy I just read? Ta-da, it's here, it's me. And the Bible says, and the eyes of the people were fastened on him. And he says, recovering of sight to the blind. Why does he say that? He says that because they were looking at him. They were looking at Jesus but they couldn't see him. They were looking at him because they were blind and they couldn't see him. So he was saying, I want you to see. I want you to know that the goat, the greatest of all time is right here in your very presence. Hallelujah. Mic drop. Drop the bomb in the synagogue. So now when we use the term, the greatest of all time, what we're saying is this person is at the top of the list. What we're saying is they have established their supremacy. What we're saying is they have set the standard in a particular area. And what makes the GOAT is that you've done it over time. You've had, you have longevity. And what makes the GOAT the greatest of all time is the reputation, how good your name is. And what makes somebody the GOAT are their accolades. You know, what have they accomplished? when you are deciding who the GOAT is, who the greatest of all time is, it's usually based on your preferences, based on your experience with that person, based on what you have seen or what you have heard. And in my experience, in my experience, Jesus is the GOAT. He's the greatest of all time. And let me help you out. Let me help you out with this. I don't care how old you are. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. You know why he's the greatest? You know why he's the GOAT? I don't care what you've done in your life or what you haven't done in your life. He covers you with his blood. Now, there might be some people that are out there that are skeptical and they ask, well, how do you know? How do you know Jesus is the, is the GOAT, Reverend Larry? Well, because ain't nobody ever walked on water like Jesus did. Come on, somebody, come on. He turned water into wine. He's the goat. Now, do you know what happens because he's the goat? Mountains listen to him and mountains are moved. That's the goat. I don't know what you might consider a good day for you, but a good day for Jesus is that he was walking in a town, once he was walking in a town called Capernaum, and there was a man who was brought by four friends. The man was on a mat and they ripped off the roof of the house, roof of the house, and they lowered the man down and Jesus told him, pick up your mat, follow me, you're healed. That's a good day for Jesus, hallelujah. And you know what else happened in the day? One day, 
Jesus was preaching and he walks on the scene and there's this man named Jairus and he was a ruler who called Jesus because his daughter had died. And then there was this woman with the issue of blood that hears that Jesus is coming to town and she believes that God would heal her if she could just touch the hem of his garment. You got to be the goat. If you don't even have to lay on hands, she just touches him and she was healed. Jairus' daughter was brought back to life all in one day. That's a good day for Jesus. And that's why Jesus is the GOAT. Now check this out, check this out. When you read scripture and you do a little bit of study on scripture, you will see that way back in the book of Genesis, Jesus was actually there. You know, God, God was there in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter one says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, Jesus is part of the us and Jesus is part of the hour of creation and that account that's found in Genesis. Jesus is the word spoken about in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's goat worthy right there by itself. The prophets prophesied about Jesus. He hadn't even existed yet. And Isaiah said, and you shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Come on now, come on somebody, that's the goat. That's the goat. Jesus even self-proclaimed. He called himself the goat in Revelation 1.8. He said, I am alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending. I am the one who is, who always was, and still, and is still yet to come. Jesus is the greatest of all time. Jesus is the goat. You know why else Jesus was the goat? He had the biggest fish fry ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He took two fish and five loaves of bread and outdid a whole slew of lo red lobster restaurants. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And that's why he's the goat. You know why else Jesus is the goat? Because there's nothing you could do, nothing that you could do that could ever separate you from his love. Hallelujah. Nothing. You're covered. Jesus knew what you would do before you even did it. And he already set aside his blood to cover what you didn't even repent for yet. That's goat worthy right there. That's the Jesus I serve. Jesus was so awesome, professionals left their professions to follow him. They just dropped everything and followed him. Jesus was so awesome that when the disciples had fished all night, Jesus shows up and he says, hey, throw your net on the other side. And they got so much fish, so many fish that they didn't have room to receive all the fish, exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. Jesus is the man. Jesus is the goat. At the last supper, he washed the feet of somebody that was going to betray him. That's the kind of God I serve. I serve the greatest of all time. I serve Jehovah Shalom. I serve a God of peace. I serve Jehovah Jireh. I serve a God that provides. I serve Jehovah Tiskanu. I serve a righteous God. I serve the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I serve a Jesus who wakes up and storms the silence. That's the kind of God I serve. I serve a God who walks on water with no flotation devices. He's great. He's amazing. And somebody might say, well, well wait a minute, Red Larry. You're a pastor. You're supposed to think about Jesus that way. Well, if you think that, you don't know me. You don't know who I used to be. You don't know how I still need Jesus every day. I don't love him because of my position. I don't love him because I'm supposed to love him. I don't love him because I'm a minister. I love him because he covered me when I didn't deserve to be covered. He's the greatest, the greatest of all time. 
And in and of myself, I'm not even qualified to be here speaking to you today. But God, but God, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved me. He brought me from a mighty long way. He has blessed me beyond measure. He didn't have to do it, but he did in spite of myself, in spite of myself. Praise God, praise God. Now, if you just take a minute, just take a minute y'all and think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for you. Hallelujah. Just take a minute and think back over your life and see the hand of God working in your life. There's no other conclusion that you can come to other than Jesus. Jesus the Christ is the greatest of all time. Hallelujah. There's some final thoughts. Some final thoughts about why he's the greatest of all time. He's the greatest of all time because no one, no one has ever loved like him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Nobody, nobody has loved like him, loved like him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever, I love that, whoever, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter if you are a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how big you are or how small you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. Whoever, whoever, you are in that whoever. And because you are in that whoever, you should be grateful because whoever believes in him, hallelujah, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And you know why else? Why else Jesus is the greatest of all time? Because you don't have to wait for worship service on Sunday to get to him. Hallelujah. He's the greatest of all time. Why? You don't need a pastor. You don't need a deacon to lay hands on you, to lay hands on your children, or lay hands on anybody in your family. He's the greatest of all time. He's the greatest of all time because you can wake up and lay hands on yourself, hallelujah. He's the greatest of all time because even if you're sick, if you're sick in your mind, sick in your body, sick in your spirit, whether or not you might be afraid, you might be distressed, you might be disheartened or whatever you might be going through, faith, your faith in Jesus can kick in because of the hand of Jesus, hallelujah. And I don't know about you, but I have experienced Jesus in my life. And I'm so thankful for that. He may not come when you want him, but guess what? He's always right on time. And maybe the top reason that Jesus is the greatest of all time, hallelujah, is because that he redefined, he redefined what death was. He conquered death. He overcame death. He conquered death because he was sinless when he died on that cross. He laid down his life for me. He laid down his life for you as a voluntary sacrifice. And because he did that, he removed the penalty of death, the sting of death. And now everybody, man, woman, boy, and girl, everyone who believes in him has victory over death. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors because of his love. We are so thankful that he is the greatest, the greatest, none like him of all time. He is, he is the awesome God. He is all everything, almighty God, and there's none like him. And we're thankful. I'm so glad. I'm so thankful that I serve the greatest of all time. There's no dispute. There's no arguing. It's proven. It's a fact. It's in his word that he is the greatest of all time. And he has longevity to prove it. He, is, he has been here before time and he'll be here after time. He is the beginning and the end. There's nothing like him. And because of that, because of that, that makes him the greatest. He is the greatest of all time. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give the Lord a hand praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. The greatest. Hallelujah. The greatest of all time. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty good about that. I feel good about that thing, y'all. We sir, do you know who do you know who we have in our corner? Do you realize who we have in our corner? Hallelujah. Man. We've got the greatest, the greatest of all time who knows us. You know, I got I got an autograph of Hank Aaron. And I thought that was something at one time. But guess what? I already had Jesus' autograph. Hallelujah. I had the autograph of the greatest of all time. Hallelujah. 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 We're thankful for who he is. We're thankful for what he has done and what he continues to do because he's still alive, y'all. He's still the greatest. He's still serving. He's at the right hand of the Father right now, a position of authority, a position of greatness, a position of influence. And whenever we mess up, he's got us covered. He's got us covered because he's just that kind of God. He's just that kind of Christ. He's got us covered, coming and going. All you got to do is profess your belief in him and you can have that covering too. There may be somebody out here today, somebody out here that's never experienced that covering, has never experienced the confidence that you have, the joy that you have, knowing that Jesus has your back. No matter what you might do, you can be forgiven. No matter what you have done, you can be forgiven. Whatever you're doing right now, you can repent and be forgiven of it because Jesus is that kind of God. He's got it covered every which way. He's got it all in his hands, all in his hands. And all you have to do is yield and express your belief, confess your belief in him as your Lord and Savior. Is there anyone out here today that wants to serve the greatest of all time, that doesn't know them for themselves, but wants to know him, wants to have that personal relationship with him, the greatest, the greatest, the greatest. Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest. No, 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 no. Jesus is the greatest. He's the greatest, no argument, no competition. And if there's someone out there that maybe you're looking for a church home, you don't belong anywhere. And it's, it, is, it behooves you to be a part of a fellowship, to be part of a loving family of God where we can bless you and you can bless us. And if you think that you're looking, if you're out there looking and you're looking for a perfect church, guess what? If it's a perfect church out there, as soon as you join, it won't be perfect anymore. There is no such thing as a perfect church. There is no such thing as a perfect church. We're not a perfect church, but we'll love on you. We'll minister to you. We'll disciple you. We'll support you. And we want you to experience what we experience on a weekly basis at Olive Branch. We give that opportunity to you. Well, praise the Lord. It, it appears that we're all saved. We're all home folks. And we praise God for that. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come to you once again, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that even before the foundation of the world, you knew what we would need. You knew that we would need a savior. And you sent your son to die on Calvary's cross, to die on our behalf, so that we would have a right to eternal life through our belief in him. So Father, we're eternally grateful, eternally grateful to you. We're eternally grateful to Jesus. We're eternally grateful for your spirit, Lord, that resides within each and every one of us. We love you, Lord, and we know that you love us. So, Father, we just pray that you will just continue to guide us, 
continue to work with us, continue to minister unto each and every need that we have, Lord. And Father, we lift up those among us who are recovering right now, Lord. Those among us who are recovering from uh, the virus, those among us who are recovering from all, all sorts of illnesses and, and sicknesses, Lord. We pray, Lord, for their strength. You said in your word, Lord, that your strength was made perfect in our weakness. So we ask, Lord, that you touch them in their weakness and give them your strength. We pray, Lord, that as they uh, interact with medical professionals, Father, we pray, Lord, that you will give those medical professionals wisdom and insight into their care so that they may receive whatever it is that they need through you, through your ministering spirit. We pray, Lord, that you will just bless them in a mighty way and bless their families, Lord. Protect their families, Father God. Hold their families up. Those who are caregivers, those who are in uh, are, are providing uh, sources of relief for them, Father God. We pray, Lord, that you will just bless them in a mighty way as well. And Father, we just pray for Olive Branch Baptist Church as we are uh, about to uh, end this first month getting close to ending this first month of this new year, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to give us guidance on our vision, that you will continue to work with us and put people in our path, Lord, that we need to make this vision come to fruition. So Father, we are continually in prayer for a prayer ministry. We are continually in prayer for all of our ministries that are out there, Lord. We ask your blessings on each and every leader, each and every ministry, each and every member, bless us collectively and bless us individually. Because Lord, we need you, Lord. It is a needing time, Father God. And we need you, Lord. We need your strength. We need your encouragement. We need your love. We need your protection. We need so much, Lord. But Lord, we just acknowledge that you're the greatest. You're the greatest of all time. So there's nothing that's too hard for you. So we trust you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We magnify you, Father. We adore you, Lord. And we give this time, we give our lives to you. This is our prayer. This is our hope in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and henceforth and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.